Imagine an apple in your mind's eye as vividly as you can. Okay. Uh, what colour is it? Uh, it's green with a little red shiny bit on it. Oh, nice. Mm. Uh, is there a little worm <laughs> in it? <laughs> uh, there is now. Oh, great. Yeah, it's got a, f- a little face on it, actually. It's not a real worm. It's a cartoon worm. Oh, you've got a cartoon in yeah, mind's eye. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, when you imagine an apple, um, it turns out that many of the same brain regions are active um, as when you actually see a real apple. Mm-hmm. And until recently, it's, uh, it's been pretty unclear how the brain distinguishes between, well, I know that this is a real image and this is something that I'm just seeing in my mind's eye. Mm. I think there's a line like that in The Matrix when Morpheus is talking to Neo about what's real and what's not. Uh, you just it's channeled been a, it. a good 20 years, but yeah. maybe it kind of... <laughs> lodged its way in there. Um, But this study that's out now has found areas of the brain that help a person differentiate between what is real and what is imaginary. And Carissa Wong has been reporting on this for us. Hi, Carissa. Hi, Penny. Tell us more. Yes. So for this study, the researchers got the participants to imagine like very simple visual patterns while also looking for uh, those patterns on uh, blocks. Um, So specifically, the participants had to uh, imagine seeing some very faint diagonal lines on these squares grey blocks Mm. and but only in half of those blocks uh, were there actually those lines so they were imagining lines whilst also seeing lines on some of the things that they were looking at yeah yeah. i've got i've got a quote from steve fleming of university college london who explains it quite well okay here he is in our experiment we asked people to imagine simple patterns on a computer screen and the sneaky thing we did was that sometimes we would fade in the same pattern that they were trying to imagine and asked them whether what they saw was real or just in their imagination. And we found that people sometimes confused their mental images for reality. And these confusions were more likely to happen both when people's imagination was very vivid and when the activity in an area of the brain known as the fusiform gyrus was particularly active. And we also found that a brain area in the frontal lobe, the anterior insula, was involved in deciding whether something is real or imagined. Yeah, so as Steve says there, the participants um, were performing this task. And at the same time, they used this technique called functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging to basically record the brain activity um, of the participants. And then by looking and analysing those brain recordings, uh, the researchers were able to pin down certain patterns of activity that helped them distinguish between reality uh, and their imagination. The team found that the strength of activity in the fusiform gyrus increased as people saw things more vividly. And when activity in that area was strong, people were more likely to say something was real rather than their imagination. Okay, so the stronger the activity is in the fusiform gyrus, um, the more likely it is that that object is is real rather than imagined. Is, Is that it? That's one part of it. And so the fusiform gyrus also, they found, collaborates with another part of the brain, a bit deeper in the brain, called the anterior insula. And essentially what happens is as the fusiform gyrus activity increases, if it crosses a certain threshold, this seems to boost the activity of the anterior insula. And, And when the researchers looked at the activity in the insula, they kind of saw this more binary pattern of activity so that when the insula is very active, Mm. participants see that as reality. And then if it's much lower, um, then it's then it's imagination. So you've potentially got like a, a gradient of activity in this one bit of the brain. And then when it crosses that threshold, it flicks a switch in the other part of the brain where it says, OK, this is real. But that, I guess that can kind of give you a, a hint of why we might get confused sometimes if, if where that kind of flick of the switch happens. Exactly. Yeah. So about that confusion or where this, the click happens, it made me think of um, conditions like schizophrenia when mm. sometimes you can't distinguish between reality and in imagination. And I asked uh, Steve Fleming about that too, and here he is. We think these findings can help us understand the origins of hallucinations in disorders such as schizophrenia. So some patients will experience hallucinations, but they know that they're not real. They have what psychiatrists refer to as insight. But other patients lack insight into their hallucinations and treat them as real and it's often this lack of insight treating the experience as reflecting reality that causes distress rather than the content of the hallucinations themselves 
An exciting area for future work is to test whether insight into hallucinations in patients with schizophrenia might be governed by the kind of reality monitoring mechanisms that we're identifying in this study in healthy volunteers. That's really interesting, the link to schizophrenia there. Um, what also about dreaming? Because that's not real, but it can feel really real. Yeah, and I absolutely thought of that as well. And I, I asked Steve about that too. When we dream, our capacity for reality monitoring seems largely switched off because we typically treat our dreams as real, even though they're just internally generated experiences. And one idea is that this is linked to the decrease in prefrontal cortex function during dreaming. When we're awake, we need to be vigilant and make sure we're not responding to things that are just internally generated. We don't want to run away from an imaginary tiger. But because our bodies are usually immobilized when we're sleeping, perhaps this lessens the need for the brain to distinguish reality from imagination. It's quite cool to think when you're dreaming, because you're immobilized and it's safe, your reality detector is switched off. Mm. That's really interesting. Well, there's loads to get into yeah. here. I've done, you know, I think we should come back to this. Yeah, more so on, much... on, on dreams and yeah. reality, yeah. Um, and the other thing that, you know, I mentioned the Matrix at the beginning, like, yeah. you know, 20 years ago. Okay, you haven't seen it for a long time. <laughs> Maybe longer than 20 years ago. Oh, don't no, make, don't make years. me count. Oh, no. It's good 30 years. No. Yeah, it is. It's 1999. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mentioned that movie at the start, and I, I asked Steve about that too. One broader lesson from psychology and neuroscience is that our experiences are constructed from all the sensory data that's streaming into the brain, but we don't have direct access to what's really out there. So while we might like to think that we would know the difference between reality and simulation, as VR technology becomes more and more powerful and immersive, it might actually become harder and harder for us to distinguish between reality and virtual worlds. It feels quite hot in this room. I think I'm in a real in the real world. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it's quite muggy. I don't know that VR's got that good yet. <laughs> um, one thing this makes me think of, um, well, is that sometimes neuroscience can seem academic. Like, why does it matter if we know which brain region is is detecting what? Um, but recently, um, we ran an imagination special in the magazine, and one of the really interesting pieces on there was on the extremes of imagination. And that article was talking about hyperfantasia, and this can actually cause problems. Um, a, a bit similar to what we were talking about with schizophrenia. Yeah, so this is um, a condition that affects about 10% of people and they have a really vivid imagination and they sometimes say it's as vivid as really seeing something. Mm. And these people often have a very rich and detailed memory of their lives um, and they can pursue creative careers. So there is some upsides, mm. but some people find that their mind's eye is so intense that they confuse the real events with imagined ones. And these people may be at greater risk of things like PTSD, which is fueled by mm. uh, mental imagery, and also phenomena like maladaptive day daydreaming, where you spend so much time daydreaming, yeah. um, you kind of disrupt your own daily well, life. Well, I, I, I interviewed a woman once who had a, a condition, it's called hyperdreaming or extreme dreaming or something, where mm. she dreams all night long and doesn't go into deep sleep. Gosh. And it's absolutely exhausting because mm. you're in a, a really extreme dream all night. It's a mad condition. It's really interesting. And if you want to know more about your own imagination, we also had cognitive neurologist Adam Zeman put together five simple tests that you can do. We'll, we'll link to those in our show notes. Um, some of the tests are like the ones we did earlier, like imagine an apple, imagine a sunrise, how vivid does it look? But imagination goes far beyond just the mind's eye. And I, it's really interesting. Some of these I was better at, some I was less good at. There's things like visuospatial imagination, verbal. So for example, uh, verbal imagination is a thing. Um, what word links these three words, pine, tree, and source? I am going to punt that to the listeners. Yeah. To, to try and guess the answer, which is in our, it's online, it's in the mag. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's in the Maybe article. we'll tell it next week. Yeah, as well. yeah, stay tuned.